Hey, good evening, everyone. Are we all set? We're on. All right. Excellent. Well, hello, everyone. Um, as Michaela said, my name is Bill Platts, and I'm really excited to be back here again this year to uh, do a whole new suite of draw along programs with y'all. Um, as Michaela said, I'm really excited. We have a lot of people who have come back who've been going through the, uh, the program that we've been doing for the last uh, almost two years now since COVID began. Um, and a lot of people have been following uh, along through the YouTube channel as well. So thank you so much and welcome back. For anyone who's brand new, this is your first one. Welcome, it's, it's great to have you here. And uh, I know that a number of my students from the Queensland College of Art, we're going to be here tonight too. So welcome to y'all. Um, I would like to share Michaela's acknowledgement um, uh, of country too, and also pay my respects to the Jaguar and Turbo people, elders past, present, emerging, and, uh, and extend that, uh, that respect to any first peoples that are joining us here this evening. All right, we've got something really special in store for you. This is the first of a whole suite of programs that we're thinking about this year. And we've we're going to try to unite these programs, these drawing programs together. We're gonna to do some virtually like this, and you'll be hearing soon some announcements about some in-person things we're going to be doing too at the museum. I'm very excited to, uh, to do those. It's always wonderful to, uh, to meet y'all in person. We were able to do that last year in the European Masterpieces show and do a few live in-person events um, that were just fantastic. So keep your eye out and look forward to those. Um, now, what we're going to do tonight is a mixture of a couple of different things. We're both going to look at works from the, the Qui-Goma collection and works that are very specific to one particular narrative, to one particular story. But we're also going to be learning a, a method of drawing, a technique of drawing, which uses can use very, very specialized materials, artist materials, but you can make work at home with just basic materials that you have lying around. But if you don't want to follow along with that specialized demo that we do, and you just want to pick up a pencil, a paper, a ballpoint pen, and just draw with us, please do that too. Um, here in my studio this evening, uh, we have a couple of people helping me out. Um, sitting right over here on my right, Georgia is going to be running the board and helping me produce and, um, and looking at the chat and relaying any questions. Thank you very much, Georgia. And then uh, sitting right behind me, I don't know if you can see Billy. Can we see you behind me? There's Billy. <laughs> <laughs> and sitting behind me is Billy, who is uh, an, just an exceptional life model. And I've had the pleasure of working with Billy before, and she's going to be working with us tonight. For those of you who've done draw along in the past, um, this will be the first draw along for Billy. So she's excited to be here too. Um, now we have made a slight change. You will notice that we only have one model tonight, and that is Billy. We thought in the past, um, with our COVID precautions, we've had a male and a female model and the models have been masked. But for what we're going to be doing this evening, it's really important that the model's not wearing a mask. And so we're only going to have one model, but hopefully we'll see how this goes in the future. We'll be able to get back to having uh, multiple models again in the studio. Now, as I said this evening, we're gonna do a few things. We're going to learn a new technique of drawing, but we're also going to start thinking about visual narrative. We're gonna be thinking about the way that artists and through drawing, we tell stories graphically. Of course, as human beings, we've been using drawing to tell stories for tens of thousands of years, long before we were using words to tell stories. And it's a really interesting thing when artists tackle stories, they tackle folklore and fairy tale and myth and the way that they interpret those things. And this is going to be our through line for our program throughout this year, is we're gonna be looking at different ways that artists tell stories through drawing. And we're gonna look very specifically at stories at folklore, at mythology, at fairy tale. And we're going to bring those things into the studio in a kind of performance and a kind of theatrical matrix too. And I think you'll really enjoy that. The one that we've chosen for tonight um, is one that's well represented in the Quiet Goma collection, but it's well represented in museums all over the world. And it's the story of Narcissus. We're calling our draw along tonight, Drawing Distracted. And it seems appropriate in this day and age when everybody's trying to focus and trying to balance so many things and so many difficult circumstances circumstances and trying to fight that constant distraction is, uh, you know, something that we all wrestle with. But we're going to look at a character, a very famously distracted character um, through mythology. And that character is Narcissus. And Billy is going to be embodying the character of Narcissus here tonight. So we're going to look at that story and talk a little bit about that story. And we're going to draw through that story too. 
We're going to look at some works from the collection in here, uh, here in just a minute. And then I'm going to introduce you to some terminology too that's really specific to the method of drawing that we're going to be using tonight. So let's dive right in. I know that uh, our time always goes quickly and we want to get as much time drawing as we possibly can. So right now I'm going to head over to the computer um, over here beside me. We're going to do a screen share and I want to show you a few really, really beautiful, really special works from the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art collection talk through them a little bit, and then we'll dive right into our technique that we're going to be using tonight. So let's share that, uh, that presentation, Georgia, and I'll come over and have a and talk to it. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. All right, what you're seeing here in this very first slide, and uh, hopefully that's coming through all right for everyone. What you're seeing in this slide is a really beautiful painting by the Australian artist Rupert Bunny, and I love this painting. Bunny is a very, very well-known Australian artist, um, but one of the reasons that Bunny is so well-known is he was an Australian artist that went to Paris, spent the vast majority of his working life in Paris, um, was an Australian artist who exhibited at the official Paris Salon um, and studied and exhibited um, uh, in the neoclassical manner and the romantic manner. And it wasn't until very late in life that he returned to Australia He's from Melbourne, from Victoria, and returned very late in life. This is a work done while he was still living in Paris, um, circa 1920, and it's a painting of Echo and Narcissus. Now, Echo is the nymph, the, the, the female character that you see on the right-hand side, um, and she shows up in Ovid's Metamorphosis, as does Narcissus, the character, the male character that you see on the left-hand side. Um, the story um, that the Roman poet Ovid tells is a, is a tragic tale. It's a tale where each of these characters has their individual story, but they also intersect together. Echo was a nymph who was punished by the gods so that she could only repeat the last thing that others said. And that's where we get the word echo. You know, that's where we think of the concept of echo. Eventually she wasted away to nothing and all that was left behind was the echo of her voice. But she also fell madly in love with this young boy named Narcissus, who was a famously beautiful um, young man. And Narcissus, had, there was a prophecy about him that if he ever were to become aware of his own beauty, he would be lost. Um, but if he was not aware of his own beauty, he would live a long life. And we're seeing a moment here where Narcissus is rejecting um, the, uh, you know, the, the affection, if you will, of uh, Echo as he looks down at his own reflection in the pond. Now, typically in images that show this story and show Narcissus, we typically see Narcissus and see a kind of mirror reflection in the pond as he's looking at himself. And according to the story, he became so obsessed with his own image, he too um, eventually wasted away and died. And uh, where he, uh, where he uh, <laughs> faded there by the pond, a flower bloomed that is, the, uh, of course, the Narcissus flower that we know. Um, in the 20th century, late 18th, um, well, sorry, late 19th and 20th century, we also began to think of the word um, narcissism, right? Freud wrote about narcissism, this idea of self-absorption and obsession, sexual obsession as well. But artists now for hundreds of years, thousands of years, even going all the way back to Rome, um, did images here of Narcissus. And one of the interesting things about the images of Narcissus is that they include the reflected image, the mirror image. And we're gonna be doing that tonight as you do your drawings. Again, I'll say about this bunny um, uh, painting, which is again, one of my favorites. I love this period of his paintings here in the late teens and twenties when his paintings become, became far more colorful, there's a heavy dose of French symbolism. Um, the French symbolist movement in these paintings are kind of mystical and strange, and they have these beautiful mythological stories in them. So um, park that Rupert Bunny image in your mind and look forward to, uh, to uh, seeing it in the Qui-Goma collection too. The second image is very different. This is a contemporary Japanese artist, uh, Tomoko Kashiki. And, uh, I was thinking about her work, um, not just because I love her drawings and paintings, but she was heavily featured in APT7. Of course, the Asia Pacific Triennial is happening right now at Quayagoma, APT10. But a few years ago in APT7, there were several of her paintings. And oftentimes her paintings deal with loneliness, longing, isolation. Um, they deal with water and the pond and even the reflected image over and over again. So as I was thinking about Narcissus and thinking about works in the Quayagoma collection, 
I thought about this and I want to zoom in on it a bit too so you can see the quality of the of the drawing sorry about that everyone I was just in the middle of talking about how much I love Tamako Kashiki's work <laughs> well look I'll, I'll show these other two slides uh, really really quickly and then we'll get we'll get back to uh, get back to the drawing look on that theme of Narcissus though I also wanted to show Kusama's Narcissus Garden um, a lot of you might have seen this work. It was installed at the Queensland Art Gallery, and it's a really beautiful work. Um, Narcissus is a consistent theme in Kusama's work and has been for decades and decades. This was actually a work, if you look at the, the, um, uh, the caption there, you'll see it the first time it happened was in 1966. And this was actually at the Venice Biennale in 1966. And Kusama did all of these thousands of these balls, these reflective balls. Originally, they were made out of plastic and she was actually selling them. So I can't remember, don't quote me on the price, but it was only like a, a dollar or two. You could actually buy one of them at the, at the Biennale. Um, but this is an installation view. They're now made out of stainless steel. They're gorgeous. And if you remember them floating around in the, uh, the water feature at the Queens and Arc gallery it was really fantastic but again here we're looking at that reflection that endless reflection and that constant sense of mirroring and studying one's own reflection again and again and that uh, that multiplicity of reflections again is a theme that re that uh, recurs in uh, in Kusama's work but the last work that I want to show you here is this work. I'm not going to go to full screen again because I'm afraid it'll crash my whole computer, y'all. Um, is this work by Michael Zavros, um, contemporary artist, um, a, uh, a alumnus of the uh, art school where I teach, and uh, a really, really fantastic uh, painter and drawer. And this work, Bad Dad, um, is one of my favorite works of, uh, of Michael's um, from 2013, in which he, um, he was doing a residency in Italy. And while in Italy, he saw Caravaggio, very famous image of Narcissus by Caravaggio. And he was thinking about that. And then he did his own Australian um, interpretation of that Narcissus myth here called Bad Dad, where he's in the swimming pool with the pool toys, looking down there at his own reflection. And if you look at the reflection, I'll, I'll have you, um, you know, it's easy to keep your attention on, on Michael's face there. But if you look down and look at the reflected image, you can see the distortion and how it actually becomes um, somewhat disturbing and even monstrous there. And that's an interesting thing about the Narcissus story is that the reflection is not you know, when we look at ourselves in water or a pond, we don't get that perfect mirror image, right? We get something which it has become mediated by the uh, by the water surface too. So there's Zavros's Bad Dad, um, a work which is hanging right now at the Queensland Art Gallery um, in their uh, in their Australian collection. You can go have a look at it. It's a it's a just an absolute beautiful uh, painting. So I would recommend you do that. All right. So there's just a few highlights from the uh, from the the museum's collection. Again, I I really apologize about that. That, uh, that uh, slight hiccup that we had. Georgia, can you put the camera back on me again? All right, thank you so much. I'll come back to you. Hey, am I back? All right. <laughs> nice. That was the quickest computer restart and get up and running again in, uh, in history. All right. Look, the next thing I want to do now is I want to move over to my demo table. I want to go over to my demo table and talk you through a little bit of some of the materials we're going to be using. And then finally, we can turn our attention to Billy. And we've got a whole little setup behind us um, with a reflecting pool and with, uh, with uh, some, uh, some soft furnishings around so that Billy can settle in as Narcissus and we can do some drawing. So let's switch it over to my demo table now and I'm going to talk you through what we're going to be doing here this evening. All right, I'm on demo. Thank you so much. Now, I forgot to give the little caveat at the beginning of the uh, the workshop here today that uh, my studio does, does sit right next to the train track. So occasionally you might hear the trains going by in the background. Hopefully that won't be too noisy for y'all. All right, Georgia, can you make that window bigger for me so I can see it? Thank you so much. All right, there we go. All right, I've got a whole variety of stuff here on my surface, as you can see, and I want to talk you through what each thing is, and then talk you through a little bit of the differences between them. We are going to be doing a technique tonight of scratching. Now, scratching is an old technique of drawing, of making marks. It's one of the oldest, actually, techniques of, of making marks. And it's been used in so many different ways by so many different artists. But when we talk about it in a contemporary sense of using scratching, we're usually talking about a couple of different techniques. And those couple of different techniques are really, really interesting. I'm actually gonna write the name for you so that you can see it. Hopefully this isn't mirrored here on the surface. But one of those techniques is called grattage. Can you see that all right, Georgia? 
grattage, G-R-A-T-T-A-G-E, which means scraping. It literally means scraping. But another that's in French, a, 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 a derived from the French. But I also want to introduce you to an Italian word, which is scraffito. And that's S-G-R-A-F-F-I-T-O, scraffito. And that also means scratching. Now, these are really, really wonderful, you know, good art history words and good material words. Grattage is a word that really came about during the Surrealist period, an artist named Max Ernst, who would do oil paintings and put oil surfaces down and then scrape back through the oil surfaces. He would even combine grattage with frottage, rubbing, where he would put oil on a surface and then put something underneath that surface and scrape across the surface of it. So the scraping would pick up the impression of whatever was underneath. Scraffito is an old word, which means scratching or scraping, which goes back to ancient techniques in pottery, ancient techniques in wall decoration of putting different colored clay and plaster down and then scratching through the layers of plaster to expose what's underneath. Nowadays, in a contemporary sense, you'll see both of these words apply to any sort of scraping or scratching kinds of uh, uh, strategies. You can buy materials for scratching called scratch board in in, uh, in North America or scraper board in the UK, um, which are sheets of paper which have a clay coat, a white clay coat, and then a black ink over the surface, and you can scratch through. What I'm gonna be showing you tonight is how to use basic materials like these that are around on my surface right now so that you can make your own you know, grattage and your own scraffito and your own scratchings. All right, so let me tell you what I've got here. First things first, over here on this side, I have crayons, basic wax crayons. And you can see I've got children's crayons. I rated my kids' book lists for their old twistable crayons. I've got the cheap crayons here that just show up when you go to the uh, surf club, you know, and they want to keep your kids entertained and they give you that kind of crayon. So I'm going to turn up the light a little bit there and make it a little bit brighter. Okay, so I've got just cheap crayons and you can just pick up any crayons that you have sitting around the house. Those are perfectly all right to use. These are wax based. They just have a synthetic wax base and some pigment mixed in with them. But over here on this side, I've got some slightly higher quality materials. Now, these are oil pastels and here, um, right here in the middle are oil pastels made by the French company Sennelier. Now, these are a fairly recent invention. They haven't been around for very long at all. These were only invented about 150 years ago. They came into uh, widespread use. And it's a mixture of linseed oil or safflower oil brought together with non-drying oils like coconut oil or mineral oil and wax. And all of that is mixed together with pigment. The important thing about oil pastels, and again, I have here some cheap oil pastels, again, that were part of my kids' elementary school book list that we just bought at Office Work too. All the same stuff, pigment mixed in with wax and non-drying oils. It's really important to note that oil pastels are non-drying because when you draw with an oil pastel, it's greasy, right? And soft and oily, and it will stay greasy and soft and oily. It never dries out. It's very different from these materials, which are paint sticks. This is an oil bar. This is a Sennelier paint stick. These have drying oils, linseed oils in them. So if you use paint sticks or oil bars, those will eventually dry out on the surface. If you use oil pastels, they won't because these use non-drying oils. So that's a major difference between those two things. The other type of uh, material I have is a grease pencil, a china marker made for marking on porcelain or china. And again, this contains non-drying oils in it mixed together with wax and pigment. So those are the basic materials I have here. Now, I also brought, for any of you who are interested in printmaking, you can also use lithography crayons. So I have some litho crayons, which are, again, waxy, greasy-based crayons. And here I have a whole box full of stones crayons. And stones crayons are, again, used for lithography. And those are still waxy crayons used for making uh, drawings on litho stones. All right, so if you have some basic oil pastels or even just basic kids' crayons lying around, you will be beautiful for this. 
Now, the other thing that you will need is something to scrape with. Now, you can use just a basic craft knife, and this is just your, you know, a number one exacto knife with a number 11 blade in it. It's the most basic type of craft knife, and these work really, really beautifully for this kind of uh, scratch, scratching drawing. But I also have, you know, this type of box cutter, which you can use any sort of knife like that. I even have a bamboo skewer here for barbecuing. That will work really, really well. I have here a pin, a hat pin. The hat pin will work beautifully for scratching. I even have some small eyeglass screwdrivers and small uh, size screwdrivers. Basically anything that's got a little bit of an edge that you can scratch with will be fine. So if you're doing this with kids and you don't want them to be uh, swinging around their number one uh, knife, then feel free to just use a toothpick, a skewer, a screwdriver, anything like that, even a knife from the kitchen will work for this, uh, for this technique that I'm gonna show you here this evening. Now, the other things that I have, I have basic white drawing paper. All right. So this is just an A4 size piece of white cartridge paper, drawing paper. I've got that. I also have some trace paper. All right. So this is a piece of trace paper. All right. That you have there. And I have baking paper. You know, when in doubt, um, you have beautiful paper to draw on in your kitchen, in a drawer, and it is that, baking paper. All three of these will work for the technique I'm going to show you tonight, but I'm going to show it to you on all three so that you can see it. Georgia, do we have any burning questions coming through so far? None, none, of, them are, none of them are burning. Okay, beautiful. All right, let's get into showing you the technique now. And I want to show you the right and the wrong of this technique. Now, this is how you can make your own scratch board or your own surface to do this kind of grattage or scraffito. The important thing to do with any of the surfaces, whether you're working on your white drawing paper, your trace paper, or your baking paper, is you have to seal the surface first before you put the layer on that you're going to scratch off, all right? And you seal the surface with a wax crayon. So I'll show you as an example, I am gonna take this super cheap, just children's, you know, Crayola crayon right here, twistable crayon. And I'm just going to scrub. Georgia, can you see that? All right. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to scrub a little patch of it on there. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm sealing the fibers of the paper, right? Which is a cellulose paper, a wood pulp paper. And I'm sealing that first. And that's really important. And it's unfortunately the step that a lot of people miss. Once I've sealed it, then I can put another layer of crayon on top of it. And so now I'm going to go over it here with a black crayon there. Okay. Right over the top with a black crayon. There we go. All right. Is that showing up? All right. A nice black, uh, a nice black surface. And I'll grab my exacto knife now there, my number 11 blade. And I'll show you how now you can just scrape right back through that and get a beautiful, let's see if it zooms in on that. Will that focus on that? beautiful clean line like that. And I can do a very, very fine line going across it there too. And the reason I'm able to get such high contrast and such beautiful line work is because I put that layer of wax underneath it. You'll see, I'll also keep a little rag here next to me so I can just wipe off that, uh, that wax that I'm scraping off on there. So that was using children's crayons and nothing else. Now you can get a little bit fancier with this if you want to, and you could go to, again, this is a scholastic grade. This is your <coughs> office works type oil pastel right here that comes in a set. All right. And I can do the same thing. Lay down that white. Now you could do colors underneath it too, obviously, but I'm going to stick with white. I'm going to lay down that white oil pastel first to close out the paper fiber. And then I'm going to take a black one. Okay. So I'm going to take now a black oil pastel. I'm going to go right over the surface of that with the black oil pastel. There we go. How's that showing up, George? All right. There we go. Yep. Okay, good. And then again, I can take my knife. All right. Or here, I'll switch it up. I'll go to the bamboo skewer now. And I can just scrape right back through that and get a beautiful, beautiful, clean scrape coming away. All right. Is that showing up? All right. Yeah, there it is. Now, I want to show you the difference if you don't put down that wax barrier first. So I'm going to take that same crayon, and I'm going to put that same crayon directly onto my paper, right? The black crayon. 
there. All right. All right, that nice waxy, greasy black crayon. And now I'm gonna to try to scrape through it. And hopefully what you can see there on screen is that you can barely see that, right? That it doesn't really show up at all versus this, which has the wax layer or that. So putting that wax layer down first to seal your paper is essential to this process. All right, so that is it on, um, on drawing paper, but same thing on baking paper. So here, this is just a cheap piece of baking paper. I will take again, a children's crayon here. Uh, I can't read that y'all, periwinkle. All right, periwinkle. I'll lay down some periwinkle on my baking paper. It's actually quite a lovely color. It's gotta be somebody in a fantasy novel has gotta be named periwinkle, right? Okay, all right, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna lay that down first. And now I've got a China marker, a grease pencil, all right? Either or will work. Either side of the baking paper will work. All right, so now I'm laying this grease pencil down on top of it. All right, there. The baking paper is a little bit fragile. So, you know, just beware as you're scrubbing it because it's easy for it to, to crumple on you. But so now that's that grease pencil laying on top of, again, a children's crayon. And here I can grab my eyeglass screwdriver. And again, I can scrape right back through that and get just a beautiful fine mark. I can take the edge of my knife too and scrape back and just get, again, I'll lift that up so everybody can see it. Can you see that all right? Just beautiful. And that's on baking paper, y'all. So again, you don't need really, really fancy papers to do this. But again, if you were to lay that grease pencil down directly on the baking paper, all right, as I'm doing right now, and then try to scrape back through it, you're, got, you're not going to get the high contrast or that same sense of white. So there's scraping on that. You can barely even see the difference, all right? Trace paper works in exactly the same way. All right, so this is the technique we're gonna be doing tonight. We're gonna to be setting up a sheet of paper. We're gonna be laying down a, a, a layer of wax first with our wax crayons or our, our oil pastels. Then we're gonna be putting our dark layer on top of that. And then we're gonna be scraping back through in order to make our drawings. Yes. Yes, either side of the ba baking paper, either side of the trace paper, either side of the drawing paper. It's, it will work either way. Now, what we're going to be doing next is you're gonna be setting yourself up a sheet of paper so we can do our first drawings of Billy. Billy's anxious over there, she's ready. She's embodying Narcissus, I can see it. All right, here's one that I made up ahead of time. All right, so this is what you're going to be preparing now is a sheet of paper just like this, ready to scrape. So you've laid it all out, you've got a field, and then when you're ready to draw, you'll be able to take your knife and you'll be able to just start making your drawing within that, all right, in that field, just like that, okay? Yes. Oh, now depends on the wax that's in the candle. So somebody has asked on the chat whether you could use a candle to seal it depends on the wax. Um, some waxes, they might just be too hard and it might not come off. Um, oftentimes these um, wax crayons, as well as oil pastels, they all have uh, non-drying oils mixed in with them, which makes them flow onto the paper uh, more easily. So that's, uh, that's the difference, which a, a candle won't necessarily have in it. Oh, really? That's interesting. How'd my, peri how'd my periwinkle, did I do that on the baking picker? Yeah, yeah, that crayon, oh, the check your crayon. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, if your black coat doesn't come out very opaque, um, you can just layer it up again, or um, you can burnish it, you know, rub it in with your finger as well. Um, but yes, a smooth paper will work really, really well for this. All right, now, the technique to get your sheet of paper ready. Let me grab a fresh sheet of paper and I'll take you through the steps. All right, a relatively fresh sheet of paper. All right, step number one is to take your crayon or your oil pastel, and I'm gonna use this cheap white crayon right here that you can see. And I'm gonna coat the entire sheet of paper. And again, this is only, it's an eight by 10 sheet of paper, so about A4 size. If it gets some little smears or smudges in it, it's no big deal, okay? But I'm gonna go all the way around and I'm gonna go right out to the margins, leaving myself about, you know, I don't know, centimeter, about a quarter inch, 
you all know metric better than I do. You know what that is. All right. So I'm gonna, just going to keep going across. You can see I've got some little bits of black on my desk that's getting picked up, but no big deal. But basically, you want to lay that out on your whole sheet of paper, just the white. And then you can sort of feel across it. And you'll feel if it's got that waxy, greasy um, layer all the way across. And if you feel any rough spots where you can still feel the texture of the paper, right, the fibers of the paper, just hit it again. There's no way you can get too much of that waxy barrier layer on there. Yeah, now water, okay, yes, yeah, somebody has asked in the chat about water-soluble crayons. Water-soluble crayons are a whole other can of worms, but yes, they do have a water-soluble wax in them and they will work for this. Um, I, find that, uh, I find that they don't work as well as, uh, as normal grease um, uh, crayons do, but, uh, but yes, they will work for this. So if you've got the, the Caran d'Ache aqua crayons, the Neocolor crayons or any of those, yes, you can, you can use those. They do have water soluble Does crayons. Chalk pastel, chalk pastel will not work. It must be a greasy medium. So good question. Another question on the chat was about chalk pastel. One thing I'll note about um, pastels and about drawing materials in general, remember that there's three types. Oh, flip it back to me for a second. I, I miss seeing y'all. Okay, yeah. Okay, my back. Okay, remember y'all, there's three types of drawing materials. There are your dry and dusty drawing materials. We call those your friables. Those are your, your chalk pastels, your graphites, your charcoals. You know, those are the things, chalks and soft pastels, anything that's particulate and dusty. Then you have your liquids, right? Your inks, your watercolors, all of those wet mediums. The third big category of drawing materials are your crayons. And your crayons are your waxy and greasy, your fatty based materials. For this particular process to, to work, you have to be working in that fatty, greasy family of drawing materials. Okay, beautiful. Thanks, Georgia. Okay, let's come back here now. Now, I'm ready to put my black layer over my, and I know my white layer got a little bit gummed up there because I had some stuff on my desk, but I've got my white layer across the whole thing. Now I'm going to do my black layer. If you want to be um, really fussy, like I am sometimes, you can use the edge of a second sheet of paper there to mask and give yourself a nice clean edge. And what I'm doing again is leaving myself about a centimeter along the edge there, just so I have a, a part of the paper I can grab onto and handle that doesn't have that greasy black all over it. So I'm gonna work around now and I'm gonna hit all of my edges there, laying in my black, okay? And again, it's just because uh, sometimes I like to have a nice clean edge there. All right, and I'm just right, and I'm using a black crayon now. So I used a cheap um, oil pastel, just a student grade, you know, office supply store oil pastel, not a fancy Sennelier one, um, as the undercoat. And now I'm doing a black crayon on top of that. Again, just a, a cheap children's black crayon. All right, so I've laid that out, and now I'm going to just use the side of that crayon and start going over it. Now, how much or how little texture you leave is completely up to you. It's your preference. I usually like to sort of rub over it with my finger and burnish it a bit so I don't have all of that paper texture coming through. If you're working on tracing paper, you'll get less texture. If you're working on a white drawing paper, you'll get a little bit more texture. So it really is completely up to you. You can also try mixing different ones. So you could go with crayon, and then on top of the crayon, you could even put on some oil pastel. Again, you can work in different colors, but for tonight, I'm just gonna do black and white to keep it simple rather than getting into polychrome. All right, and I'm just gonna put a nice layer, nice and greasy and waxy there on the surface is what you want, y'all. All right, and there we go. And again, if you want to, you can burnish it and rub it in like that, or you can leave the texture. But once you have that ready, you're ready to draw. All right, now obviously I've got quite a lot of texture there. The one that I made up ahead of time, I burnished a bit more so it doesn't have quite that much texture in it. And that would just take you a little bit more time to do, putting a little bit more of that crayon on, rubbing it in and getting it on the surface. But again, when you're ready to go and you've got a good surface to draw on, you should be able to take your knife or whatever tool you have and you should be able to cut across it and even scrape back through it and get a really, really bright, clean mark like that. Yes. Yes. Um, what is the benefit of using tracing paper over regular black paper? 
Yes. So um, the benefits of, I would say, tracing paper is less absorbent than, uh, than white drawing paper, cartridge paper. In terms of benefits, tracing paper will be smoother. That's the main benefit to using tracing paper or baking paper, is it's going to have much less tooth or texture than a white drawing paper. Now, for those of you who know a lot about paper, if you've got a hot press paper, a calendared paper, which has a much smoother surface, um, uh, like a Bristol board, that's fine. But typically, um, when I do these workshops, some people prefer working on the tracing paper or the baking paper, because it has far less tooth and it's just smoother than the white drawing paper is. Yes. And one more question, y'all, which is being relayed to me. Is the black on top oil dry on its own? Yes. So it, well, the black, uh, the black I put on top of that one was just children's wax crayon, but it does have a little bit of non-drying oil. Um, it, it will have a little bit, actually what it is, y'all, is coconut oil. Typically, it'll have a little bit of coconut, which is a non-drying oil. Sometimes they have mineral oil in them as well. Um, the earliest oil pastels were made with coconut oil. All right. Good, did I answer those questions? Beautiful. Now, one thing to think about when you start drawing, because we're going to get into it now. I know y'all have been patient. Um, we're going to get into the drawing. Think about the black and the white. Now we're thinking about positive and negative. There's going to be a way of drawing Billy, Narcissus, in which you start drawing lines just like you would in black on white, but you're drawing white on black, and you're getting a kind of negative mark that way. When you're talking about working in scratch board or scraper board, one thing you have to think about is playing with the light in the dark. So if you want to have an edge, one thing that you can do is lay out a white line that, that shows the edge, but then you can come back and scrape along that line, right, to remove some of that material, right? So you don't perceive that white line anymore, but you just see the dark against the light. Let me lift that up so everybody can see, right? So now you're perceiving the dark against the light. You can even scrape both sides of a line, right? If you want to make a black line, you can scrape out on both sides, as I've just done there, and just leave, right, the black line in between. So you have to be strategic and think through it. But the beautiful thing about working in this manner, some people will make their own scratch boards or scraper boards by putting black ink, uh, a liquid ink over the surface. I prefer to use the greasy media because if at any point you do something that you don't like, you just come right back in with your greasy media and just rub right back over it. And then if you need to, you can re-scrape it again, right? So you can work back and forth. You can even blend. So into that white mark that I just made there, I can even just come back in with my finger and I can just blend and get beautiful, beautiful gradients coming into the white too. So working with the greasy media gives you a lot more flexibility and pushing and pulling and working back and forth than working with, uh, than putting a black painting black ink over the surface of it, which is the way most people teach it and do it. I personally find that to be an inferior way not to, not to, uh, you know, <laughs> George is laughing at me. Not to, I didn't, that sounded harsher than I meant it to be. Okay. All right. Let's get to drawing then. Hopefully through my talking through that whole process, y'all have had a chance to build up one layer. Again, if you don't have these materials and you're just here to, to draw and to, to get together with us, feel free to just grab a pencil and paper and draw along with us. Okay. Now, we're in just a moment, we're going to switch over to our view of, uh, of Billy as Narcissus. And Billy is going to be posing. We're going to do a little bit of a zoom in. So we're really focusing on more of a portrait. We're really looking at her face. She is going to be looking down at herself. I should say Narcissus is going to be looking down <laughs> at, the, uh, at the reflection in the surface. Then I'm going to zoom right in and show you that reflection, and you'll be able to draw through it. All right. So let's our water our pond is set up billy are you set okay let's switch us to this camera okay yeah we can have you up there and i'm going to zoom in let's get you a little bit closer to the mirror though your your head a little bit closer to the mirror there we go beautiful um that's it yeah perfect all right how's that coming through georgia Okay, so we'll have to get you down lower, Billy, closer to the mirror, or maybe even on the mirror. Perfect. Yes. Ah, that's dynamite. How's that working, Georgia? That looks great. Okay. All right, so now you have this view of, uh, of Billy 
as Narcissus regarding himself in the water. Now, obviously, you've got a lot of decisions to make. You see light, you see dark, you see pattern, right? You see the texture of the robe, the texture of the, the, the glassy mirror, which is the representative of the water and all those things around the patterns. This is where you have to be really selective in your approach to the drawing. So Georgia, if you bring it back to my demo really quickly, what I'm going to start with, and then we'll switch it back, I promise y'all, what I'm going to start with, and I have a slightly different view than y'all have here, but as I look, what I'm going to start with is I'm going to start with a really light sort of gestural line drawing in the same way that I would any other drawing. So the same way I would start sketching with pen or with pencil or with charcoal. Instead for this, I'm going to start by just scraping. Okay, back over the surface. Is that showing up all right there? Yeah. So I'm scraping back over the surface. So I'm going to start to lay out my composition first, even where I'm seeing the background there, where I'm seeing the surface of the mirror and things hanging down. And I can do that very, very quickly and loosely on the surface. But then what I'm going to have to do is be selective, where then I'm going to have to really think about where do I want to get a highlight? Where do I really want to start scraping out a lot of information. So if she's looking down and I see her face and her forehead looking down, or there's a lot of light coming onto her nose, coming onto her cheek, around her eye, et cetera, et cetera. I'm gonna to start to really scrape that information out and get, that, uh, get the shape and the highlight there. And the same thing for the mirror surface. I might start to see the mirror surface as a very, very light surface, which is going to be reflecting a lot of light and start scraping it back. So you're gonna be strategic. And again, it's impossible to mess up because if you don't like what you've done, just draw back over the surface of it again with your black, rub it back in, you've erased and you're ready to scratch again. All right, let's turn it back over to Billy. Billy, how are you feeling there? All right, let's go 10 minutes on this first drawing, y'all. Okay. Narcissus, we will focus you. All right. There we go. How's our focus? Beautiful. All right. Looks good. I might zoom even a little bit more, y'all. Okay. I'm gonna zoom in a, even a little bit closer. There we go. That's perfect, right? Okay, and I'm going to manually focus too. I'm going to look at it on screen and manually focus. Nice. All right. All right, y'all. Let's go 10 minutes on this. I'm getting a big thumbs up from Georgia about how that looks. So that's outstanding. Okay. Now I'm going to, I'm going to slowly sip my coffee while all y'all drink. Uh, I was going to say while y'all drink out there, while y'all draw out there. All right. Now, again, really think as you're looking at this entire composition, start with that really light sketch, scratching through the surface to, to give the overall composition. You might be zooming in. You see the beautiful way in which um, Narcissus's hair flows down, hits the mirror, and then continues right back down to hit the other face, that dual portrait that you're getting there. But of course, the top figure completely obscured. That could go right into the darkness. Let all of that beautiful darkness of the surface that you've created, and then the light on the chest, the light on the shoulder, the light on the hips or the legs could really pull out away from that. If you want to try to get some of the texture of the reflections of the water, you're certainly more than welcome to. This is just a warm up, y'all. So give it a whirl, start scratching, and I'm going to talk more while y'all draw. Let me just have a sip of coffee. All right, now that you're scratching, when you're, the reason that scratcher board, scraper board or scratch board became so popular in the late 19th and 20th centuries, early 20th centuries, it's now largely become obsolete. But the reason it became so popular is it was a way of making line art. Line art, a particular type of art for reproduction, which was purely black or white. So it could be reproduced easily in newspapers, magazines, et cetera, and printing. Now, the, uh, I was going to say the best way, I probably shouldn't put that sort of value judgment. <laughs> the common way of creating that kind of line art for reproduction was a process of engraving. Engraving requires a lot of skill 
very labor intensive. There used to be big engraving shops. They were all over Australia. They would employ um, dozens and dozens of lucky art students who would sit there and do engravings of images and illustrations to be printed in the popular press. Scratchboard gave illustrators an alternative to that because Scratchboard was far less labor intensive. It was quicker and it was less expensive to do than engraving. And it would give that high key line art, that black and white line art. Of course, Scratchboard got completely displaced by the digital as so many other things did. And the ability to take any sort of image and run it through a digital filter in order to turn it into line art, in order to turn it into a, a black and white image for reproduction. Um, and then of course the need to even have line art then goes away <laughs> completely, you know, and is displaced by halftone screens and then by digital printing, all of those things. So um, it's a really, really beautiful, slightly obsolete method of drawing using scratch board, scraper board, or this type of, uh, this type of grattage or scraffito, but it also gives a material texture an effect. It gives you a sense of hatching, right? Massing lines together or cross hatching, which is very different from doing it in ink or pencil or other materials like that. But the other thing I really love about this is it introduces you to a different way of using crayons and oil pastels. A lot of people don't like to draw with crayons and oil pastels because they think of them as too rough, too clunky, too difficult to get fine details and fine lines. So this is a method by which you get that sort of roughness and texture and beautiful meatiness, if you will, of uh, crayons and oil pastels, but you can also build in that really precise fine line work, which you might really enjoy using as an artist. All right, about halfway there, y'all. Narcissus, you doing all right? Beautiful. All right. Again, scratch it up. Keep it quick, keep it loose, try some different things. Really try using the edge of your needle or your skewer, or your screwdriver, or your knife or whatever you're using to scrape away a lot of the material to expose more of the white from underneath. So you're getting that good graphic push and pull of black and white on the surface. All right, do we have any other burning questions in the chat there, Georgia? I could answer while we draw. Ah, oh, yes. Okay. So somebody in the chat mentioned they used a makeup sponge for blending. And not only can you use a makeup sponge for blending or a little bit of chamois or a tissue or anything like that, uh, any sort of little sponge, but you can also use that together with a little mineral oil, a little alcohol, and you can even lift and dissolve on the surface. So yeah, you can play because again, we're dealing with fatty, greasy, um, materials here, um, waxy, fatty, greasy materials, you can use other types of materials that can push and pull those fatty, greasy materials around. So not only can you burnish or buff it with a sponge, something like a makeup sponge, but you can also use other types of materials to mix in. And baby oil, baby oil is just mineral oil, baby oil or coconut oil is something that you can even blend in to these materials yourself to get different, uh, different effects on the surface. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, this is a wonderful, uh, no, I get a lot of education students in my classes at the university. And so we're always talking about things that, especially those who are thinking about going on and teaching in primary school, there's a lot of ways that you can use um, those basic, again, those scholastic grade, very inexpensive oil pastels, I would recommend over crayons for this, but you can do it with colored crayons too. Now, whatever you put down underneath as your barrier layer, you're going to lose most of that color. So you could get a whisper of that color coming through, but you're going to lose a lot of it. But certainly on top, you can do a very, you can do a polychrome. You can do lots of different colors on top to scrape through and then layer more on top of those colors and scrape through. And you can just keep layering it up that way and get really dense and beautiful effects. Think back to that Rupert Bunny painting and that beautiful sort of transcendent color and that beautiful sense of just um, otherworldliness that, um, that he achieved in that. And the sort of depth and richness of that color is something you can build up quite easily using your crayons and oil pastels. All right, one more minute, y'all. Final minute. And as always, Michaela mentioned it as, at the beginning,
But as always, we're going to ask you at the end again uh, to share these drawings with us, to share, to use the uh, Home with Quagoma tag um, and the other tags that uh, I'm sure Michaela has put into the email or the chat or that she'll show up again at the end. I love seeing them. We love seeing them uh, uh, shared with us. And to the people who just come up to me on the street because they saw this and they open up their phones and show me their drawings, I love that too. <laughs> All right. Let's bring it home, y'all. Last few seconds. We're already an hour in. Where does the time go? I know it. All right, now we have to see, will Narcissus be able to pull away from her own reflection? I'm not sure. <laughs> Billy, thank you so much. Outstanding, excellent. Okay, you can bring it back to me, Georgia. <clears throat> All right, are we back? All right, nice. Now, as Michaela said at the beginning, all of these draw alongs that we do are recorded and they will be posted to the Quagoma YouTube channel. And now we have our own channel for draw along where not only can you go back through any of the other draw alongs that we've done, but the museum has also done this really wonderful thing where they've gone in and sort of extracted just the demo parts of some of them. So you can go in and just see me teaching you how to make avocado ink or something like that too. Um, but it also gives you the ability to come back to these drawings again, because you have, an, Billy has just posed for 10 minutes, but you have infinite time because when that video gets posted, you can go back and look at that image again and again and again and draw from it. So if you didn't finish that one completely, that's okay because uh, there will be an opportunity to come back to it. But I do wanna keep moving on and I wanna show you another method, a slightly different method using the same technique, but going about the drawing in a different way. All right, and it's called the silhouette method. And we're gonna pop it back over to my demo table and I'm gonna show it to you um, really quickly. All right. George, are we back on? Okay, beautiful. All right, so that method was preparing the paper first. And again, the wonderful thing about Scratchboard now, typically my students are gonna be going crazy because it, uh, I never let them work small like this. <laughs> but this is really a, a lovely way to work at a quite a small scale. And especially when you're home working at your kitchen table or uh, somebody sent me a wonderful image of themselves doing this in a national park while they were camping, sitting there on their uh, laptop and doing it. But if you have limited space, um, then you can work at this A4 scale, A3 scale, and it's a really beautiful way. And even some people do scratch boards that are very, very small. And, uh, but highly, highly detailed because you can get such a fine line with it. But another way that you can work if you wanna work a little bit larger is using a silhouette drawing method. And now this is how this works. All right, so I've got a fresh sheet of paper here. Is that showing up all right, Georgia? Okay, I've got a fresh sheet of paper. Now I also have here next to me a pencil. All right, so I'm done now. Y'all can't see Billy, but I can see Billy. She's sitting here just uh, chilling out for just a minute. <laughs> but if I were to do this next drawing, one um, approach that I can use is to just sketch out roughly where Billy is in space. All right. So let's say I saw her, she's sitting there and she's just relaxing right now between poses, but she's sitting there on the mirror, right, with her knees out like that and her arm. And I can do a quick sketch, just a sort of silhouette sketch like that, which has the mirror coming around her there. Okay. Then once I have that, and I can do that in pencil, I can do that lightly in, uh, in some other material and crayon or whatever you want, but I'm gonna do it in pencil because then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna isolate the scratch board. I'm gonna isolate that, uh, that technique of that, you know, again, that, you know, what do you want, grattage or scraffito or scratching just to where Billy's figure is, all right? So now what I'm gonna do is inside that quick outline that I did, I'm gonna take, I'm taking another white, um, this is a different, this is a Holbein oil pastel. So I just keep, I'm just using different materials every time y'all. And now I'm gonna lay down a white barrier layer, but I'm gonna put that white barrier layer just where her body is, okay? So again, think of it like a silhouette. All right, so I've got a nice, I'm gonna feel it. So I can feel that I've got a good coat on the entire surface and there isn't a lot of paper coming through there. All right. And then again, I'm gonna take just a, again, cheap black crayon, or maybe I should, well, no, I'll just stick it to cheap black crayon. And I'm gonna put that cheap black crayon right over the surface and in the silhouette too. 
And again, if I go a little outside, doesn't really matter. I'm going to keep it beautiful and loose. Like that. Okay. Like that. So now I've got this silhouetted figure, but the silhouetted figure is a scratch board, right? Okay. And now I'm going to go over it and I'm even going to burnish it a little bit with my finger. Yeah, it is, right? It's like the ring, you know? I saw the, the ring, the American version. I actually took a cab home from the movie theater, even though it was only like four blocks from my house. I was so done in by that. Okay, there we go. All right, so now I've got a silhouette, but now what I can do, if I'm gonna start developing the drawing, is I can come in and I'm gonna scrape just inside that silhouette. So where I see Billy, you know, the hair is hanging down there. I see a shoulder and an arm. coming to where her hand was, sitting right down there, and her legs. Right, so I can start to scrape inside of that silhouette that I've got. Now, again, I'm doing a negative image, but it doesn't have to stay a negative image because the other thing I can do is I can scrape along the edge to create a much finer shape if I want to, and because I've got my number one exacto. Is that picking up, Georgia, how beautiful and smooth that is along that edge? It's such a lovely way to work, y'all. And, and I can either keep it white on black like that. I'll pull it up a little bit so you can see that. Or if I want to, now I can come in and I can make it a black line by scraping back inside. And if I have these folds, in her skin, I can scrape around those folds, but preserve them, right, as a black line, and then scrape that out, right? So instead of having a negative image, I can scrape out and start to create a positive image. And it'll start to look almost like an old woodcut or an old lino cut or something like that, you won't be able to scrape it all the way back to white. You'll get a little bit of staining and bruising, but again, that's just part of the beauty of it. And so I could come back in here and preserve, and then coming down her arm, I could even preserve the contour of her arm as a black line instead of a white line and start to bring it out inside. Is that working on camera there, Georgia? Yeah. All right. And I'm just using the edge of the knife and cutting through. So I start to get a positive instead of a negative. But with all of that beautiful texture inside, but now I have all that white paper around too, where I can work directly onto that paper. I could continue to do some scratch areas to that various parts of that paper. I could come in just with my crayon or my, uh, my China marker here. Let me peel my China marker a little bit, get it going. There you go. And I could do some drawing, some direct drawing, right? Right on top of that, that adds to this graffito drawing that I'm doing. I could do a mirror reflection where I start to think about maybe the mirror, right? Comes out as negative rather than positive. So you can really just play with the way that you develop that drawing. But now instead of blackening out the entire sheet of paper, we're being really selective in where you put down that barrier layer first with your white, then laying your black on top and then scraping it back. Yeah, a bit like that. So yeah, and it's when you see these drawings too, people will look at them and they feel like monotypes. They feel like lino cuts. You know, there's something really, really beautiful. And it's also because, you know, print, Printmaking ink has that beautiful density and richness to it. And this, because you're using these greasy, waxy mediums, will have this beautiful texture and denseness to it, too. All right. Narcissus, are we ready to go again? Yeah. All right. Okay, y'all. So I want you to experiment this time with that silhouette technique. All right. Let's switch it over to Narcissus. I'm going to switch the view a little bit on camera. Get yourself comfortable now, because we're going to go 15 minutes on this one. Okay. Maybe even laying on your side, like on your hip would work. Yeah, there we go. Beautiful. 
Beautiful. Now, now I don't put too much weight on your shoulder. Do you need a pillow there for your elbow? You should be okay. All right. Yeah, I'm going to just zoom in a bit, y'all. How are we looking on screen there? Are we good? We're cutting off. That's it right there. I'm going to come up a little bit. There we go. Good composition, y'all. Okay. If you, need, um, if you need to shake it out or anything, Billy, just let us know. All right, y'all, we are going to go 15 minutes on this, and I am going to begin your time now. If you're hoping for 15 minutes of silence, you are out of luck. I will talk. <laughs> I'm going to have a sip of coffee and then, uh, and then get right back in. Oh, Billy, that looks amazing. Fantastic. Okay, so now, as you're, again, thinking strategically, we intentionally made this a very complex scene. One of the things we often get when we're doing life drawing is just the, the body on the blank dais spotlit, right? Nowadays, um, going from the 20th into the 21st century, we're getting more costuming, more theatricality in life drawing, but we intentionally made this um, a very, very busy scene because some images of Narcissus, you really get the emphasis on the pastoral. Right, this idea of this kind of bucolic landscape, um, and this you know this beautiful you know young man just sort of uh, gazing at himself in the water, and there's a there's a sense of uh, lushness and and uh, sort of seductiveness to the entire thing. But you also have examples like Caravaggio's example. Um, if you look at Caravaggio's Narcissus, the one that inspired uh, Michael Zavros to do his Bad Dad, it's it's classic Baroque tenebrism. So it's all black um, with just the hot light on Narcissus himself, this, uh, this young man and the mirror reflection that it's, that's at the bottom. There are a lot of contemporary takes on the Narcissus myth as well that look at nature and the relationship to nature in different ways. So obviously here, you've got the pattern on the carpet. You're getting Oh God, I guess quite a lot of reflection of some of my drawings hanging on the wall, <laughs> you know, the cushions and pillows, right? All of those different textures coming together. And you can think about different ways you can use the texture of the oil pastel or the crayon in order to communicate those textures too. But what I was going to say about, the, uh, about just the myth and looking at the communication of the story is also think about the reflection. What's, think about the Zavros painting again and the relationship between the way he depicted himself and the way he depicted his reflection in the water and that slight distortion, that slight um, uh, sense of uh, a kind of psychological distress that goes on in the reflection that's seen. And of course, for Narcissus, Ovid write, writes very carefully about the, you know, the fact that the water was undisturbed, right? This perfect sort of reflecting pool. But you can imagine the slightest ripple or the slightest um, uh, uh, disturbance of that surface would completely alter that reflection and the perception of oneself in that reflection too. We should pour some water on the mirror. What do you think? <laughs> yes, do we have another question? Um, yes, so can the crayons be sealed later? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, oil pastels, again, um, a, a fairly, you know, I think people, people erroneously think that oil pastels have been around for, you know, centuries and centuries, and they haven't. There have been wax-based mediums, um, wax crayons and caustics, you know, those um, beeswax has been used as an artist medium for thousands and thousands of years. But what we think of as a contemporary oil pastel, which is this non-drying oil mixed together with the wax, mixed together with pigment as a drawing tool, is a relatively recent um, invention. Again, didn't really come on the scene until the late 19th century and become widely available until the 20th century. And art supply, Sennelier actually was the first art supply company to make them. Um, and then it was really not until the mid 20th century where you really saw painters who wanted something that they could draw with that behaved like paint behaved. And that's where you really see oil pastels come, um, come to the fore, but they will not dry. They are non-drying oil based and wax based. So they will stay soft and somewhat fragile you know, for their life. So typically what happens with an oil pastel is typically a piece of um, a protective paper is put over the surface of it, something like glassine or something that won't stick to the surface. And then they're framed in a very particular way to, so that nothing abrades or comes up against the surface. But there, there are ways that you can add drying 
um, agents and drying oils to the surface, but it's not really recommended. One of the things that makes an oil pastel an oil pastel is the fact that it does not dry. That's part of its, um, its ethos. But you do have that other material I showed you, you can use for this, the paint sticks. I showed you the oil bar, which is the Windsor Newton brand and the Sennelier paint stick and lots of other companies make paint sticks. And those do have drying oils in them, safflower oil, linseed oil, and even have cicatives, drying agents in them as well. And those will dry on the surface, um, just like an oil paint, uh, oil painting will dry on the surface. Did that seem like that answered that question, Georgia? Okay. All right. Nice. Nice. All right. How's it going, y'all? Cruising right along? Yeah. I can't wait to see these drawings. These are going to be so good. Now, you can see that um, I like to do a, a few um, slightly disruptive things when I do my life drawings, too. And you can see in this one, of course, I'm illuminating um, Narcissus here with the, uh, the projection of the water, which is in some ways giving you some cast shadows, but in other ways is really reducing the body to these really graphic forms. And so it's going to be, it's going to give you a lot of room for invention, a lot of room to play with the way that the body flows in and out of the space and the way the body flows in and out of the mirror and the reflection too. All right, about halfway there, y'all. <clears throat> All right. Any other burning questions before I go on to my next bit? No? Okay, good. All right. Now, um, as we go through this uh, second half of this pose and move forward, I do just want to mention briefly this interesting tension between mirror reflections and water reflections. And it's something which uh, scholars have written about in terms of the Narcissus myth and in terms of uh, the, um, the idea of one looking at oneself in a pool of water. Because as you can imagine, looking into a mirror, a contemporary glass mirror, industrial mirror with a silvered back, gives you a kind of precision of image that you wouldn't get looking into water. And it's something which fascinated artists, and oftentimes you see artists playing with, is what is the relationship with an obscured reflection, which is what you would get in the surface of water, versus what we get in mirror images, which are their own strange phenomenon. And artists have been fascinated by reflections and mirrors, again, for thousands of years. And mirrors are, particularly, uh, are a particular interest of mine in drawing and mirrored life drawing in particular, and what specifically happens within the space of the mirror which is like or unlike what happens in the space outside of the mirror. When we're talking about mirrors, we're dealing with virtual worlds, worlds that seem to extend beyond the surface. And so mirrors are both a beautiful metaphor for the image itself, for the surface of the image as a two-dimensional image carrying matrix. But mirrors are also very mysterious, Im uh, mysterious images, mysterious devices, devices that we don't have a very clear understanding, or most people don't have a very clear understanding of how exactly they work and those angles of reflection work. And so the mystery of mirrors, I think is really important. And I think the mystery of the Narcissus myth is one of its most interesting points that what was Narcissus seeing in that reflection, right? What was his experience of that reflection um, and his obsession, his compulsion with it? Um, and the idea that it was simply a mirror image, I don't think, uh, I don't think completely captures the richness or the, or the depth of that story or its abiding fascination for writers and artists as well. Okay, and of course in, in, in Kusama's um, uh, Narcissus Garden, she does the spherical mirrors. And of course, just doing a spherical mirror um, uh, and you know that kind of a convex mirror completely distorts and changes the, um, the surface. How are we doing there, Georgia? Oh, is your elbow? Just need a little. Uh, okay, all right. Sorry, we're just gonna readjust there. I will refocus y'all. No, you're fine. No, you're fine. Is that good? Okay, we'll refocus. Did that refocus there? Yes. Beautiful. Okay. You have about five more minutes, y'all. Five more, Billy. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay.
All right, I'll do a little bit more scraping on mine while y'all work too. And again, I'm showing you some of the basics of these techniques, but I can't wait to see um, all y'all will have your own approaches, your own sort of clever interpretations of this and how you can use this medium. And I can't wait to see that. Um, the wonderful thing about having so many of y'all out there is that I can really learn from the, the variety of, uh, of methods that y'all try. All right, I'm gonna do a cast shadow there. Okay, and we've got no, no comments about um, arterial spray. Nobody's cut off a finger yet, nothing like that. We're all right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. I should have said at the beginning, of course, if you're using your, uh, your number one knife for a number 11 blade, uh, you know, just, uh, just be careful, they're sharp. Someone said funny, an unfocused image could distract the drawing. <laughs> Yeah, the distracted drawing, that's it. Okay. Now we're gonna move on to one final um, technique after this one concludes. I wanna show you, not really the same technique, but a different strategy, a different approach. Um, and we'll do one more warm up drawing and then we'll have time in our final push to do a longer drawing where you can combine these techniques or come up with your own method of mixing and matching them. Good for about another th three minutes, Billy, is that all right? I mentioned his name before too, but I'll just, um, I'll reiter reiterate if anybody, if nobody there has, um, who's out there has ever um, really looked at the work of the surrealist Max Ernst, who's the one who coined that phrase, uh, phrase grattage. Um, Ernst is E-R-N-S-T, Max Ernst. And you should take a look at some of the old grattage works. They're wonderful in which he was like uh, rubbing over fish bones, fish skeletons, um, scraping and making all these amazing textures and, uh, and images. It'll show you a different method of using a, or a different approach to this same method. Final minute, y'all. Everybody's drawing, 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 drawing. <laughs> we do actually have um we have a beautiful, beautiful ambient sound of running water here in the studio, but I don't think the mic's picking it up. <laughs> I don't think anybody can hear it. We've got, we've got this lovely, um, we've got our own lovely little pastoral scene going on here in the studio. Narcissus, thank you so much. Brilliant, beautiful. Okay, let's bring it back to my demo um, table here again. Georgia, please. All right, thank you, beautiful. All right, the last method, everybody take a deep breath. Whew. I know we're going into, we're getting into our last 30 minutes here and our, our last push. Um, these evenings always go so fast. Uh, but I do want to show you one more, uh, one more technique that you can use, which is a pure scratching technique. And I'm actually going to come back over to this one that I prepared before to show this to you. And it's what's called directional or dimensional hatching. Now, when we talk about hatching, Hatching is just bringing um, massing lines together to give the illusion of form or of value, light and dark. So as soon as you start creating lines like that, you're hatching, right? And as many of you know, if you take one set of lines and then come across it with another set of lines, now you're cross hatching. 
And hatching and cross hatching are just ways that you're using black and white, again, that line art, but you're starting to create a variety of tones, right? They optically mix in order to give you the illusion of different grays that are happening within the black and the white. Now, when we talk about dimensional hatching, we're talking about taking those hatching lines and actually imagining them wrapping around the surface that you're drawing. All right, so if we have an arm, <clears throat> losing my voice already, I haven't lectured in so long, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's good. All right, so if we have an arm coming down to an elbow and a forearm, which is coming down like that, and let's say that is an elbow and a forearm that's coming down and then there's a hand, right? Uh, down there and we won't get into too much detail about all of that but let's say and there's a thumb all right so we've just got a hand an arm coming down to a hand can you see that all right georgia and you say there's a shoulder right up there okay i'll try to rub out that other stuff so that that's more easy to see okay when we talk about cross hatching right let's imagine the lights coming down on the top of the forearm right and so you want to get the sense of light so you just start hatching to get the light, right? And then you wanna get more light, so you cross hatch, right? And you come across it and you get a sense of the light on the top of the arm, right? Just like that, okay? That's one way to go about it. The other way to go about it is to actually think about your hatching following the form, all right? So I've got the exact same arm there, okay? But instead of just snip, 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 snip with straight lines like that, instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is imagine those lines wrapping around the arm. And I'm actually going to follow the shape of the arm with those lines that I'm hatching. All right. And if I do that, I'm going to start to get some dimensional hatching. In other words, the curving of those lines is going to start to give me a sense of the shape of that arm. Okay. And so I'm massing the lines together by wrapping them instead of just doing straight marks like that. And you can do this either going across the form like I did that, or you can go uh, around the form like around and down the back of the hand, or you can do long lines, imagine almost like a topographical map where you start ma massing those lines together, right? And because you're using different directions to those hatching lines that you're creating, you're gonna start to get the impression of different shapes and forms on the surface, all right? So dimensional hatching is wrapping those hatching lines around the form that you're seeing, so it's following the form. Now, typically, instead of going with the long axis, you wanna go across the contour, across the axis, because that will give you a better sense of the form. Yes, Georgia. Um, well, yeah, the black and the white, look, if, you've, if you're putting the black on top, it shouldn't pick up a lot of the white. If it does pick up a lot of the white um, that's coming from underneath it to start to create a gray, before you put the black on, rub the white in a bit, just sort of burnish the white in a bit on the surface, um, and then try putting your black on top. It could also be, if you're getting a lot of mixing, that you're getting too much white underneath it. You only need enough white to seal that paper, but you don't want a really thick, gummy layer of that white underneath. Okay, all right. So try using just a little bit less of that white underneath it. Okay, so dimensional or directional hatching, again, is taking those lines and matching and massing those hatching lines together so that by massing those hatching lines together, you're starting to get a sense of the three dimensional form that you see. Now, this is a little bit trickier because you've got to be able to imagine the shape of the form. And then you've got to start to think, okay, I'm wrapping around and how am I traveling around it? So before we were doing a lot of very graphic scratching where you're scratching off big areas. Now I want you to really practice hatching and massing those finer lines together to see what you come up with. Now, you can either prep a whole sheet of paper like this um, to do that, or you can use that silhouette method because it's a little bit faster and just silhouette the area that you want to practice that dimensional hatching on. 
Okay, we're going to do this one for about, we're going to do a quick study here, y'all. So only about a five minute study. So prepare your sheet of paper or get your sheet of paper ready to do your silhouette drawing on it. And I will, um, I will do the same thing. And then we're going to do a quick little five minute study to give us enough time to get into our last longer drawing too. All right. So again, here, I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at Billy before you switch, George, just bring it back to me for one second. I'm looking at Billy. Um, I know y'all just got a quick peek too. So like, if I see like um, Billy's legs coming down like that, right. Her thighs coming down like that to her knees. Right. And I'm getting that kind of a shape there. Is that showing up for you, Georgia? Okay. And I'm going to do it just with my grease pencil so that you can see if I'm doing directional hatching again, instead of going straight hatching lines like that, I'm going to now imagine those lines wrapping around. Okay. Now I'm doing this positive instead of doing it negative by scratching, but that's the idea is that you're imagining how those lines, and if you want to get it even more, you just add more of those hatching lines in, but you're still thinking about it wrapping around the image like that, rather than coming in and just doing a series of straight lines to show value like that. Okay. All right. Let's do it. Let's switch over to, uh, to Narcissus again. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. And let's get you. Yeah. How's that? How's that feel? Let's actually, can we even get you? No, for the last one, we'll do that. Forget it. You, you do, you do you. I'm going to zoom out a bit. Yeah. I, I have an idea what it will do for the last one, but I'm going to zoom out just a bit there. Yeah. Hand on the mirror would be great. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Dynamite. George is giving me another big thumbs up. Okay, this is gonna be quick y'all, five minute sketch. All right, so quickly in five minutes, you can either practice the dimensional hatching or do a quick silhouette. And then within the silhouette, do your scratching off to do that dimension. So wrapping those hatching marks around the form. All right, five minutes, let's begin. And I'm actually going to get into the shot a little bit too, just to demonstrate, all right, seeing the, the image that you're seeing. So as you're seeing this image of, of her leaning forward to imagine the lines really wrapping around. So as her thigh, am I in the shot? As her thigh goes away from you that direction, imagine the lines wrapping going away that direction. And then as she comes back towards you, the lines wrapping back this way. So you're, the way that you curve those lines and wrap them around the form is not only gonna give you a sense of the volume of the form, but it's also gonna give you a sense of its movement, its direction in space as it comes towards you or recedes away from you. Now, this is a, I'm just introducing this. We could spend an entire session just on this kind of dimensional hatching because it is a, a very particular skill and uh, it is a slightly difficult skill to learn, but it's something to start practicing. It's also something to start looking at. If you look at old examples of line art, scratch board or engravings, you'll see this kind of dimensional hatching in action. And you can really look at it carefully and study it and study the way that it gives you a powerful illusion of three-dimensional form, but also a powerful sense of value of light and dark. All right. I nursed that coffee for almost the whole time. <laughs> Now, for our last pose too, we're going to do a very, very classic Narcissus pose of Narcissus laying by the pond, um, gazing um, at the reflection. So, and we're going to give you, a, we want to give you a little bit more time for that. I'd like to do at least 15 to 20 minutes on that. So again, we'll keep this one fairly brief, just so you can experiment with it a bit. And then we'll go into your longer drawing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, and, you know, one of the things when you're doing the hatching, 
you can still preserve that contour line. So if you remember before when we sort of carved out the white on both sides of that line, but maintain the black, this is, a, again, it's a little bit more technical. It's a little bit more difficult, but you can do the same thing when you're hatching. When you're hatching, instead of going all the way to the edge, give yourself a little bit of a gap right there. So it maintains a bit of a contour, right? A bit of an edge there, because yes, it's, it's, a much, it's a much more difficult thing when all of your hatches start to overlap with one another to start to discern those edges. However, it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, the expressiveness and the beauty of all those overlapping textures and hatches can give a lot of vibration. And even if you might lose a little bit of, okay, exactly where does the, you know, the, the lateral side of the hand end and the, uh, and the thigh begin, it's still, you know, that captures the overall, uh, the, the sense of uh, vibrancy in the image. And that can still be quite a, a potent uh, uh, method of drawing. Okay, about two more minutes, y'all. The hair is so good too. I know the mirror is a little slippery. Uh, the hair is so good too, because the hair can just give you those, those waves and that movement that comes down too, that you can really follow with your hatched lines, you know, and get that texture of the hair coming down. Final minute. Nice. That image looks so good. The color in it is so good. I know <laughs> it makes me want to do color now too. Yeah. I need to keep the pond in my studio all the time, I think. <laughs> And we're out. All right, Billy, thank you so much. Okay, bring it back to me, uh, my talking head camera here for a minute, George. I haven't seen everybody in so long. <clears throat> all right, am I back? All right, excellent, y'all. Really, now I know for all of these draw alongs, I know that I'm moving pretty rapidly and I'm introducing these things to you. Again, you'll have the opportunity to go back and review once the video gets posted, but each one of these techniques is not exclusive. So you might actually come up with your own method where you're saying, oh, I, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And maybe on a larger sheet of paper, I'm using some of this scratching technique and other places I'm doing direct drawing. You know, So it's really up to you to take these basic techniques and as artists have um, for ages and ages, take it and make it your own, your own idiosyncratic approach to how each one of these techniques is used. So that brings us to our final drawing. Now, um, we're going to give Billy a little breather here um, before we go into the final drawing of her gazing down at herself in the pond. For this final drawing, you're going to have a little bit more time. Um, again, scale, technique, method. I'm going to leave completely up to you for this one. I'm not going to give you that kind of uh, immediate instruction as I have for the previous ones, but I want you to explore, experiment, try some different things, try something that's a little uncomfortable, and that's a good thing. Try scraping in different ways. Try really taking off a lot of the black if you haven't done that yet. If in your drawings, they're really dominated by the black with just some very fine lines, try really getting in there with the edge of your knife or the edge of your, um, of your uh, bamboo skewer or whatever you're using to draw with and take off more of that black so that you expose more of that texture and light texture underneath. So basically just try something, um, try to build on what you've already done for the last hour and a half, but also try something new and try something that, uh, that again, might feel a little strange, uh, but that's okay. All right. We're going to get set up to go into this last drawing now. While we get set up to go into this last drawing, I want you to set yourselves up with your sheet of paper. 
with your crayons or pastels, whether you're working baking paper, trace paper, drawing paper, whatever it is. And uh, Narcissus and I are gonna have a quick chat about getting set up. Yep, so for this one, um, you <laughs> Excellent. Okay, now let's get you. Um, yeah, perfect. Perfect. Now I'm going to zoom right in. Now, do you need something under your elbow there? Let's you want to grab that the, the cushion right there to put under your elbow. Perfect. We'll just make sure we can still see. Yeah, no, you're fine. Perfect. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right, Billy's just getting yourself adjusted. Beautiful. All right, y'all. Now we are gonna go for this last one. What time is it? Ooh, we'll not quite be able to squeeze out 20 minutes, a little bit shorter than that, but we're gonna go at least 15 and I'll try to squeeze out an extra minute or two in there. All right, nice and zoomed in. How's our focus look, Georgia? Focus looks good. Okay, beautiful. All right, we are gonna go 15 to 18 minutes <laughs> on this pose. Now, again, think strategically about how you're using the light in the dark in this image. Look at all of that beautiful dark that's over on the left-hand side of the image. And then the way you get that really sharp light. You can even see that beautiful dark cast shadow that comes down across um, the body of Narcissus there that goes right across her navel. Yep, you can see that. Yeah, Billy, it looks fine. Looks good. All right. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, so you can see that cast shadow that cuts across. You see the beautiful little bit of articulation of shadow that you get between the body and the mirror, right? Right underneath the rib cage, right underneath the belly there. But then again, look at the way it just beautifully fades off into the darkness there around. So now you might think strategically, okay, maybe I'm going to put in a lot of that white um, undercoat and a lot of the dark around where the hair is in the background in the mirror, but leave more of the body exposed for the white of your paper to do some direct drawing on. Or you might think just the opposite. You might think, okay, you'll do a lot of scratching in the body and in the face, but then you'll just lay in with your black crayon or black grease pencil or oil pastel to that background without doing any scratching and really let it stain and push down the paper that way. So again, drawing with these materials is not always starting with a blank slate. It's not always starting with that, that sheet of paper, which has one surface, but you're really thinking about manipulating that surface, manipulating your approach to that surface um, in order to highlight the things that are important to you in the drawing. All right. You've got the beautiful reflected portrait there that sense of texture from the water reflections that are going on and that beautiful illumination, that light that cuts across and creates that strong triangular shape from left to right on the surface. Really, really beautiful. All right, and this is so good. I want to do some drawing too. <laughs> yeah, tips on drawing the water texture. Well, look, what you're perceiving there, it's difficult because what you're perceiving there is, is movement, all right? The movement of that water texture. Of course, your drawing won't move, it's static. And so what, think about it in terms of just the light and dark. Think of it as just a light and dark wave pattern. And even think about letting that light and dark wave pattern cut not just across the body, but across the body and across the background, right? So you, the more that it pushes all the way across, the more it's going to give you that sense of the environment that you're in. If it starts to feel like tiger stripes on the surface, 
again, just get in there with your finger and just do a little bit of rubbing and just soften it. Remember what I showed you at the very beginning that not only can you do the direct scratching, but you can come back in and burnish and rub to get some softer gradients and softer tones there on the surface. All right. And I've got to say, you might, if you, if you haven't picked up on it um, already in, uh, in this evening's uh, draw along, I love this method of drawing. I find it just, uh, it's hard to be too fussy. You just kind of have to get in there. There's something really beautiful about the, uh, just the feel, the texture of the, the knife on the surface and the way that it cuts through and makes those marks and those lines. And uh, I just think it's just a beautiful, beautiful way of drawing. All right, y'all, that's your first five minutes almost gone. Again, the, uh, one of the nice things about this method is it gives you a, just a beautiful approach to erasure. So if, you're, if it's, you do something and you don't like it and if you think it's gone wrong, then just, just run right back over it with your black and then scrape right back into it again. And actually the more that you push and pull, the more that you'll build up that density of experience on the surface. That's a lovely thing. Sorry, I'll check the I'll check the questions in a minute to see if there's anything coming through. No, everybody's drawing. Beautiful. Again, really think sort of conceptually about that mirror reflection, what's happening there to Narcissus in the mirror. Do you want it to be a literal reflection or do you want to do some uh, interventions there? Time check. You are in your final eight minutes, y'all.
Okay, now as we enter this final phase of the drawing, I'll say for those of you who have been with me before, you've heard me say it before. For those of you who are new, you'll hear me say it for the first time. You know, the secret to, to every drawing is tension and not tension, all right? That every drawing has got internal tension. It's got areas that are positive and areas that are negative, areas that push and pull, areas where the lines are busy and the others where they're not, right? There's internal tensions. There's also quite often narrative tension in the drawing, but also every drawing shows your attention as an artist, the thing that you were really interested in, that's really important to you about the drawing that you wanna highlight. So start thinking through that. Where do you wanna bring your audience's attention? Somebody looking at this drawing, what do you want them to really focus on and think about? And then try to amplify that aspect of the drawing, whatever it is. So you might be getting a really strange, but wonderful little effect in the eyes of your portrait, or you might be getting something in your background, a texture of your background, which is integrating with the hair there, with Narcissus's hair in a really interesting way. So let your drawing lead you, let your drawing show you what, what it's about and what's happening in the drawing, and then try to really respond to that and bring that out in your drawing. One of the wonderful things about trying out new techniques and new methods of drawing is you get really unexpected, surprising results. And sometimes, you know, wonderful, pleasantly surprising results. All right, five minutes, y'all. You too, Billy, five more minutes. Again, think what I said at the very beginning on the uh, when I was talking to y'all about um, if the black, again, is really dominating your drawings and has been dominating your drawings all evening, try just now in your final five minutes, taking the side of your tool, whatever it is you're using, and really scraping back through, trying to get some of that back off the surface, not only to expose the beautiful texture of the white and gray underneath it, but just to give your uh, a different graphic impact to your drawing. All right, y'all, three more minutes. Good, 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 good. I can't wait to see these drawings. All right, now in this final home stretch, 
again, in your last couple of minutes here, think about in addition to, you know, where you really want to bring your attention, where, where, where you want to focus and amplify the graphic impact of the drawing. Also take a step back and try to take in the whole drawing rather than looking at it in terms of pieces and parts or individual details, really squint your eyes, look at the entire drawing, look at the pattern of lights and darks, look at the patterns of activity that are happening there in the drawing, try to take it all in as a whole, especially if you've been thinking uh, or been obsessing about one little part of it, like, oh, I didn't get the nose just right, or I didn't get the hand just right, or whatever it is. Try to take a deep breath in your last two minutes, take a look at it, and then try to think about larger movements or larger structures or larger marks that you can make across the surface of it, which get out of those um, small details and instead take the whole drawing into consideration. All right, almost there, y'all. Yeah, I think this um, the the connection between the hair and the hair, and then the the reflection because that light, the light that's on uh, on the face and the reflection is so good. All right, thirty more seconds. really going to bring it home y'all yeah <clears throat> oh tick tock y'all all right, Georgia, bring it back to me. <laughs> is that me? Am I on? All right. All right, y'all. As is customary, please help me wherever you are sitting out there um, in thanking Billy for her work tonight. Bravo. <laughs> Outstanding work. <laughs> that was a uh, life drawing posing on a mirror. Good. A fresh experience. Excellent. <laughs> nice. Lots of people in the comments saying thank you. Thank you, y'all. All right. Before I go, again, this won't be the last you see of me. I would also like to give a, a special thanks. I know Michaela is going to pop back on in a minute, but a special thanks to Michaela and Anna and the whole Quagoma team for inviting me back yet again. A special thanks to Georgia over here who's running it all. It wasn't Georgia's fault. The entire computer crashed. The one time <laughs> I touched the computer before was the time that I destroyed the entire thing. So thank you, Georgia. Um, but again, please share your drawings. Um, I'm easy to find. Find me on socials. Tag me. Drop me a line. Anytime y'all want to talk about drawing, um, I, you know, I'm up for it. And look forward again um, to some announcements in the very near future about some very special events that we're going to be running this year around drawing. Thank you again, y'all. Um,